Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This video will be part 3 of Eminence. All credit goes to the author, Helgi, for his amazing story. Make sure to read the whole story by clicking the link tree link in the description, then clicking on the name of this story. This part will be chapter 4 and 5 of the story. Also don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe. Now let's get into this amazing story. Glinda Goodwitch was a great many things, but one thing that she was not was disloyal. She had bitten her tongue and nodded her head like a dutiful second in command, should for practically all of Ashbin's eccentric ideas and plans. Over the last few years, though, she had been placed in direct responsibility for Team EMNA. She was eight years older than Naruto, only six older than the girls, and despite her place as their mentor, Glinda had become close friends with the four of them. More and more the loyalty she gave only to her own mentor Ashbin felt strained when it seemed to clash directly with her responsibility and loyalty to the team. At first, the manipulations that the man planned for them were for the most part benign. They also led to helping not only the four students but Remnant as a whole. Slowly, though, Glinda felt like the true Ashbin was revealed to her. He was a unique form of egotistical. So certain he was the only one capable of combating Salem. And that meant everyone, literally everyone in the word was either a piece to be played or an obstacle to surpass. She could sadly live with that. She might disagree, even vehemently so, but the reality was there was no one else in the entire world of Remnant that knew Salem better than Ashbin. After all, he was her immortal rival and had been for a thousand years. Though Glinda privately suspected there was more to the connection between the two. Now, though, she knew she would need to begin making plans of her own. She refused to let what she believed his end plan for Team EMNA to play out. Not when she was beginning to feel certain that the headmaster planned for the team to eventually be martyred for the people of Remnant to rally around. That was a ways out, thankfully, but she had grown far too familiar with his plans to not see what the end result would be. Even if he planned for himself to die alongside them, only he would come back. Glinda? Naruto's voice broke her out of her frantic thoughts. Since she had realized what the end goal of Ashbin's moves with her team would be, she had been all over the place scrambling mentally for some sort of strategy to employ to save her subordinates without totally breaking the connection with Ashbin and possibly exposing them to be recruited by Salem. It had happened before. After all, Hazel Reinhardt was a tragic man, even more so than his sister. Yes, sorry. Here, these are the target packages prepared for the group you are being assigned to eliminate, Glinda said as she handed out the four prepared packages of documents and diagrams, as well as a few photos taken of the site from a distant aircraft. Ashbin sat silently at the table while he watched the four students flip through the booklets quickly. He occasionally glanced toward Glinda. She had been acting standoffish with him for a while, but since he had brought up the next three assignments for the team, she had become outright cold toward him. That being said, he knew her well enough that something was going on in that mind of hers. He didn't really know what to expect from her, but he knew it would likely be some sort of demand in regards to Team Yamene. That was fine. He knew he had to indulge his people at times to keep them loyal. It was to be expected he likely would have been the same a few lifetimes ago. So, we are going to track down and take out these purebred psychos? Mordred asked with a shrug. Yes, as well as rescue a number of hostages they have. The purebred militia formed some years ago and has terrorized the faunist population of Anima since. With what happened in Green Market and the growing support for the White Fang even among humans, the purebred have become more violent and inventive with their operations to try and cause turmoil between human and faunist populations, Ashbin explained. So they have started kidnapping kids? These kids are all human too. What's their plan? Urza asked. As an educator, I have always upheld the principle that the next generation is our future. It would seem the leadership of the purebred follows a similar, albeit twisted ideal, the headmaster replied. They're hoping to indoctrinate these kids and turn them into soldiers for their movement, Naruto realized aloud. Yes, from what we have gathered, the town of Limani is the home of one of the organization's founders. Around 10 miles away from the town, a compound has been constructed by the purebred for training its fighters. Recently, they have quietly gathered nearly 50 orphan children from across Anima and imprisoned them within the compound. 
We've seen images that suggest the purebred are forcing them into physically and emotionally damaging training exercises while surrounding them with anti faunus propaganda, Ashbin further explained. So we get in, kill all of these purebred creeps, then grab the kids and book it? Mordred asked, more or less. However, we have reason to believe that the children may fight you as well. They have been held by the purebred for months at this point. They could be indoctrinated or simply convinced they will suffer worse if they don't fight you with everything they have, Glinda chimed in. Great, Naruto grumbled. This mission will not be easy, and it will also be your first mission outside the familiar lands of Sanus. Still, it is imperative that you succeed, Ashbin said as he stood up. No pressure. Mordred sarcastically remarked, only to be ignored. Any questions? Glinda asked. Besides dumb ones like what kind of stupid name is the purebred? Not really, Artoria shrugged. Ashbin hummed at that. Actually, I believe I have an answer for that question. The purebred are human supremacists and thought the name mocked Faunus as a reference to purebred animals as well as a reference to their supposedly pure human genes. Just makes them sound like dogs to me. Naruto scoffed. Ones that are marked to be put down by us, I guess, Mordred murmured. Quite. Now you all have until tomorrow morning to prepare. Your transport leaves at sunrise, so try to get some rest, Glinda said as she shooed the students from the room and quickly followed them out, leaving Ashbin alone in the briefing room to sip at his drink and stare at the aerial photos of the compound his best team of students was gearing up to assault. The team spent most of the night quietly readying themselves for what was to come. They showered, ate, prepped their gear, and then got ready for bed only to sit quietly in their beds. No sleep came for them as the impending mission loomed over their heads. The many missions they had taken for Ashbin in the past had occasionally led to conflict with other people before, and they had even been forced to take a life here and there, but there just seemed to be a different weight to the fact they were going in with full intent to kill every one of the purebred. They were terrible people and needed to be handled. None of them felt that conflict even began to raise its head, but an anti-personnel mission meant no prisoners. They were expected to act without mercy. What made things worse? The people they were there to rescue were likely to resist them as well. That didn't just complicate the mission. It filled the team with dread at the prospect of what could happen in the heat of battle. They were some of the most mature hunters in training out there, more mature even than some fully-fledged hunters, but this was a bit much and none of the team was sure they could handle such a weight on their soul. It's almost midnight, Naruto mumbled. Can't sleep either? Artoria asked. Why even ask? We're all wide awake, Mordred said with a sigh. Urza sat up in her bed, slowly followed by the others. She walked over and turned on the TV before setting play on one of the few series the entire team could compromise to watch. We're not sleeping anyway. We may as well try and enjoy some time together she said as she dropped onto the space between Naruto and Mordred, who had hopped into his bed already. The perks of being the physically smallest of the team. Move over then, Artoria said to her twin, pushing her practically into Naruto's lap. Naruto twitched slightly as the girls pressed into his bed and effectively took it over, only slightly before he felt their bodies pressed into his own and recalled that he didn't mind at all for the close contact. The Knights of Beacon spent the rest of the night doing their best to ignore the oncoming challenge and simply enjoy one another's company. It worked surprisingly well, and the four of them were all asleep in a mess of bodies before the end of the episode Urza had started. That was the site that Glinda had found when she came to make sure they would be awake and ready for the mission. The woman smiled slightly at the site, though she did feel a bit envious of how loving and close the four teens were. She put such thoughts aside. They were useless and wouldn't help the team at all. That was her primary concern. Wake up you four. You need to eat before you leave. I want you all loading onto the airship with full stomachs, so that means you need to get up and around. Glinda said as she turned on the lights and loudly clapped her hands for their attention. Ugh. When did you become my mother? Artoria groaned as she and the others slowly rolled out of bed. Glinda shot the girl with an unamused look before huffing slightly. I'm nowhere near old enough to be your mother, even if you all act like little children most of the time. Now get up and around, we don't have a lot of leeway this morning. Yes, mom. Mordred drawled sarcastically only to help loudly when Glinda used her crop to actually sweat her across her butt. Mmm, 
Finish the mission fast and come back to me. I like that a little bit too much, Glinda said with a sharp grin before slipping out of the room to let them dress. The four teens stared at the closed door with shocked expressions and slack jaws. That was so out of place it simply didn't register in their minds. Did that really just happen? Urza asked. Glinda is spending too much time with us, Naruto replied as he turned back to getting ready. I think she could spend more time with us. What about you, Mordred? Artoria said as her shock gave way to interest and no small amount of amusement. That amusement skyrocketed when she saw Mordred still completely stunned silent and rubbing the spot on her rear end tenderly. Oh dear. Naruto, I think one of your girls has a thing for spanking, Artoria teased, causing Naruto to snort in amusement while Mordred snapped back to reality and blushed before chucking one of her boots at Artoria who dodged it while giggling lightly. Urza let them continue to play fight for a brief moment before clearing her throat. I'm happy to see everyone so lively, but Glinda was right. We don't have a lot of time. Right. Let's hurry up. She's right about getting a full belly too, Naruto said, feeling quite hungry and in need of a meal. Just as Ashpin had said, the airship taking Team E&MA to their mission was set to leave upon sunrise. It was Ashpin's typically dramatic flair that they assumed caused it as they piled into the small aircraft's cargo and passenger section. The craft had nothing on a bullhead in terms of size, but in terms of speed and firepower, the Muntjac possessed. It wasn't really meant for supporting people or cargo. It was designed for dropping off and picking up quickly, but it could pack a surprising punch and travel incredibly long distances in a short time if it sacrificed some firepower for more fuel. That was exactly what this airship was doing. The target was across a continent and an ocean, so every drop of fuel was needed to get there and back again with little issue. Wait, how are we extracting the kids? We could fit maybe ten in here with us. Not even half of them all could load up in here if we all stayed behind, Naruto pointed out as the engines began to roar to life. A pair of bullheads with Valian troops will follow behind you. Obviously, they won't arrive till after you have already hit the target. They are going to secure the compound and transport the children back to Vale to be placed into new homes, Glinda explained over the high-pitched screech of the engines. Will we come back with them then? Naruto asked. No, this ship has enough fuel for there, and back with a couple of hours of buffer. It will land outside the compound, and when the army relieves you, get back to the Muntjac on the double and return straight to Beacon, Glinda advised. What if we don't? Mordred asked. What? Glinda asked in confusion. What if we don't return straight back to Beacon? Mordred asked more clearly. Still, Glinda misunderstood the girl. You'll be fine. All of you. The purebred are just up-jump thugs. They aren't on your level, so handle them and come back to me, or you'll get more of what you did this morning. Mordred looked away from Glinda with a small blush at that while the rest of the team chuckled. I wish I could go with you, but I have some things to handle as well. I will see you all once you've completed your mission, she said as the door slid shut. Glinda made her way off the landing platform and watched as the ship jumped into the sky and shot through the sky. She continued to stare after it until it disappeared into the sky and then turned to leave. She didn't return to Beacon, though. She had some people to speak with. The Muntjac was indeed much faster than a bullhead. It raced across the skies over Sanus in a third of the time that it would take a bullhead at full speed. Then again, this was the cruising speed for the Muntjac. The two aircraft were really only as similar as both being aircraft. Besides that, in Naruto's opinion, the Muntjac was infinitely more impressive. By now, they were flying over the ocean, and Naruto felt an odd sensation roll through his being. The last time he had passed over the sea had been when he left Patch all those years ago. Thoughts of his sisters and what they were doing now filtered into his mind. He missed them but couldn't help but feel it wasn't the right time to reunite with them yet. His biological father being there as well made it all the easier to push aside for a later date. Still, he silently promised himself to visit once he and his team graduated. If he hadn't been before then, he wanted to visit his mom's gravesite as well. He didn't really need Summer Rose haunting him because she was worried he wasn't taking care of himself. That, and he wanted to introduce the girls to her. He just hoped it wouldn't seem too weird he was introducing them to a gravestone. He had the inkling that they would understand, though. Naruto blinked as the scenery far below their aircraft began to change. 
Deep blue sparkling in the afternoon sunlight gave way to dark green and gold as forests and sandy beaches appeared. We'll be passing over Limani in about a half hour. Prepare yourselves, everyone, the pilot called back. The team jumped to action, readying everything they needed and checking one another over. Their armor fitted into place and sealed up, ready for battle the moment they stepped out of the muntjac, just in case things went sideways the moment they set foot in their landing zone. I'll be setting down a few miles away from the compound out in the forests. I need time to spin this bird back up whenever you load back up, so if you come in with company, we'll be sitting ducks, kids, the pilot advised. We'll make sure you won't have anything to worry about, Urza reassured the man before the angelic faceplate on her helmet popped into place, and she joined the rest of her team at the sliding side doors for the Munchak. That guy isn't filling me with confidence, the metallic voice of Mordred commented through the team's helmets. He's no huntsman, and we are landing pretty close to a terrorist organization's headquarters, Naruto's voice replied. All right, enough chatter, guys. Let's get serious. When we land, secure the landing area and set up the perimeter alarms, then rendezvous at Point Alpha, Urza said sternly. Got it. The team replied together as the door slid open, and the four young hunters took off into the woods. They split up to set up the perimeter alarm system more quickly. Each of them carried a set of thin spear-like rods that they would stab into the ground in a rough circle around the landing zone. Once they were set up, the team took off through the woods toward Point Alpha, which was a well-covered outcropping of rock on a ridge nearby to the purebred compound. It took the team a few short moments before they reunited and looked down at the compound together. This was their first time seeing it in person. The aerial photos weren't of especially good quality and had been too blurry to get exact ideas on the number of guards and other staff present. Now, though, they realized they were dealing with easily more than 50 of the human supremacists. The compound itself was built into a rock outcropping of its own with buildings built up along the slopes of the stone and a large metal gate at the only real entrance to the compound. We'll need to come in from the top. Get ready to climb. You guys, Urza pointed out, there are sentries all along the rocks too. So we need to get rid of them quietly without them figuring out what's going on. If they scatter... It could be forever before all of this organization is centered in one spot like this, Artoria added. No, they'll never group up like this again. We get one shot, Naruto said with a shake of his head. Look there. It's the training yard, Mordred said in disgust as the rest turned their eyes to where she was pointing. Similar feelings of disgust swept over the rest of the team as they saw the conditions of the children. There were fewer than they had been told about, and that was easy enough to tell why. A line of smaller than normal graves lined the far corner of the compound. Not a single one bore a mark. Besides the initial anger and disgust they felt at the knowledge so many children had been needlessly murdered by these people, further outrage bubbled within them as they saw how the remaining children were being treated. Around a dozen were running, despite looking completely exhausted, while a small selection of men and women chased them with electrified batons to encourage the children to keep pace. Another two were locked into cages raised off the ground, most likely as some sort of punishment. The young boy and girl inside were skin and bones, and the reason for their imprisonment was clear at the sight of a sign below them stating simply that cowards die slowly. They must have tried to escape, Naruto growled out at the sight. We'll get them out of there, all of them, and we'll make those bastards pay for this, Urza agreed with her own bloodthirsty tone. Then let's get to it. Mordred eagerly chimed in. Right. So we'll scale the rocks on the outside. Stay in contact over your communication units, and we'll take the sentries out simultaneously. Artoria, you'll take that one there. That one's position gives you an almost complete overwatch of the entire compound. You'll do what you do best, Urza instructed. And pop bad guy heads, Artoria replied. The agitation could only be picked out in her tone because the team had known one another for so long. Artie, you need to center yourself and calm down. We go in with revenge on the mind, and we slip up. Nobody saves those kids then, Naruto chided softly. The older woman clicked her teeth, but nodded her head all the same. She knew he was right, and she quickly ran through some of the exercises that Glinda had taught all of them to remain in control of their emotions when on the job. Let's move out, you guys. We have about four hours until the army troops arrive. 
I want to have taken care of the purebred by then so that we don't risk the soldiers or the children being caught in gunfire, Urza said. The team didn't verbally respond. Instead, they split up once more to attend to their tasks and eliminate the sentries as the first step of their mission. The armor that each team member wore made scaling the steep rock faces surrounding the compound far easier than it would have been had they not had their equipment. Another team would have had a much harder time, or even been forced to try the main gate. Naruto finally reached the top of his targeted rock and crawled into the shadows as quietly as possible as the pair of sentries marked as his targets. He had to wait for the go-ahead, but the moment it came, the two guards only heard a soft whirring sound and a rush of wind before they were cut down. Naruto swept Bane through the two figures as they turned around in confusion. Simultaneously, the rest of his teammates took out their opponents just as silently until the sentry spots had been captured. Rally up at Artoria's position, Urza commanded. On the way, Naruto and Mordred responded. The team quickly moved the remains of their victims into covered spots as best as they could before bounding across the ring of rocks that made the wall for the purebred compound. There was some basic scaffolding though, so they no longer had to climb the rocks and were linking back up at Artoria's spot in no time at all. Artoria had already set about getting her position set up to provide the support her teammates would need when they really got started. She had dragged a couple of large stones and sandbags that had been around the late sentry's position into a position that gave her a good stand as she flattened herself into a prone position. We have a better angle to see the compound properly from here. So everyone memorized the layout and places of interest, Artoria advised over her calm set. Good thinking. Let's take a look, Urza said as she and the others activated their suit's limited optics. They got a good look at the compound from an almost bird's eye view. Looks like that building there is the barracks for the kids, Naruto pointed out a short, long shack that the children were being filed into after completing their run. They posted a guard outside, Mordred added. That big building seems like the barracks for the actual members of the purebred. I think that's an armory just next to it. They welded some bars for extra security and have guards posted outside, Urza mentioned. Most of the purebred walking around don't seem to be armed beyond a stun baton and maybe a handgun for some of them. If we can hit the armory first and lock it down, we take away their weapons for the most part, Artoria said as she peered through her scope at the three guards slouching around the entrance to the armory. They would be almost completely defenseless, Urza quietly commented as she also realized the majority were only armed with stun batons. Those would be completely useless against the armor of her team. Hey, it sucks, but these guys have to go. It's for the best, Naruto tried to reassure her, but it didn't really work all that well. He could understand where she was coming from. Killing someone that posed no real threat to you was not what they had signed up for. It was their task, though, and as harmless as some of these people would be to Naruto and the girls, the same couldn't be said for others. If given a chance, the terrible things these people had done to the kids would only be the beginning of what they planned. Let's focus, all right. That there is the boss and his lieutenants, Armand Howell. He has to die, Mordred pointed out someone further up the compound walls beside what was easily the nicest place in the area. Underneath it is the mess and recreation hall. Lots of bad guys inside, Artorias said as she tried to get a good look inside the building. She could only see three or four of the people inside at a time, but there was definitely a lot more going by the look of shadows passing by the window. So what's the move here, Urza? Naruto asked their team leader. The Angel of Beacon was silent for a moment before her head turned to Mordred. I want you to only use two rockets. We can't risk splash damage on the kids when this gets crazy. So once you fire those two shots, you head down to get those two kids out of the cages, Urza commanded. Makes sense. Sure, but boss lady, where am I putting my explosions at? Mordred questioned. The first I want you to put through the window of the armory. Blow it sky high. The second I want you to put in the doorway of the barracks. I don't know how many of the purebred are inside, but I want there to be that many less of them when you are done, Urza said. No problem, Mordred replied with a wicked smirk clear in her tone. Naruto, I am going to focus on getting to the kids in their own barracks. I want you to handle Howl and his lieutenants. Then make a ruckus with those ones in the mess hall, Urza said. I got it. Naruto nodded as he adjusted his grip on Bane and readied to jump into action. And me? Artoria asked. 
Take out the guards around the children's barracks first, then keep the mess hall doorway locked down until Naruto gets in there, Urza said. Easy, Artorias said simply. Urza took a moment to take in her teammates before nodding. Let's get into position then. The team separated once more. Mordred moved a short distance from Artoria and loaded a high explosive round and took aim. Meanwhile, Naruto moved to a place just above the meeting group of Howl and his men, while Urza crept closely to the area where the children were kept. Everyone ready? Urza asked. A series of affirmative answers ran through her ears before she took one final moment to collect herself. Mordred, she said simply. Here it comes, Mordred replied as she fired and sent a rocket exactly where Urza had wanted it. The rocket's fin caught the lip of one of the welded bars over the window as it shot inside, sending it just barely off course. Rather than hitting the floor just inside the building, it instead embedded itself in the wall right beside the crates of ammunition the purebred had been stockpiling. There was a heartbeat of silence as the three guards outside the building, as well as the quartermaster within, could only widen their eyes in terror before the rocket detonated causing secondary explosions of all of the ammunition and explosives stockpiled within. The explosions removed the armory from the face of Remnant, along with vaporizing the guards and quartermaster in a massive ball of flame. The Knights of Beacon didn't stop and stare at the explosion as their targets did. Artoria culled the guards outside the children's barracks, while Naruto dropped down onto the table of Howl and his lieutenants. The purebred leader proved why it was that he had his position as he rolled under the spinning slash Naruto made with Bane. The attack easily killed all of Howell's subordinates, splattering both himself and the room with their blood. Howell scrambled for his handgun, ignoring a second explosion as Mordred removed the purebred barracks, much like she had with the armory a moment ago. Naruto stood up from the crumpled ruins of the card table and turned to face the frightened and furious Armand Howell. The man got his handgun free, just as the thumping booms of Artoria's rifle, trapping his men in the mess hall below, began sounding off. Armand joined in with the fire by trying to empty the magazine into Naruto, only for the rounds to not so much as dent the beast of Beacon's armor. What the hell? The terrorist leader began to shout, only for Naruto to bring Bane down and end him. I don't really have time to banter, Naruto said as he advanced to the ledge and dropped down in front of the mess hall and waved up at Artoria to cease her fire. The sniper had done her job well, for purebred fighters lay piled around the doorway, while several more remained inside taking cover. None of them were armed with more than stun batons. Naruto took a shaky breath on that realization before moving into the room while Bane mecha shifted into its chain gun form. Back outside, Artoria had turned her attention to the gate. It seemed that a handful of purebred militia had been sent for a supply run and had been on their way back when the fireworks started. The lead truck, a heavy-duty cargo hauler, was making a beeline for the gate with the obvious intent of smashing through it. Artoria took exception to that strategy and instead planted around through their windshield about where the driver's chest was. A puff of red splattering across the windshield marked her kill, and the truck careened off of the roadway and smashed into a tree instead. The other drivers seemed less inclined to be shot, and quickly piled out of their vehicles looking for cover. Two of them never got close, and one fell behind the collapsed tree his comrades had taken cover behind as his last act on the mortal world. Heads up, we have perhaps another twelve armed fighters outside the gate wanting in. They have better weapons, but I don't know if they are good enough to stack against our armor. Artoria warned the rest of the team. I'd rather not find out, Urza began. Actually, after that whole time with Naruto bashing his knee, I reworked some of the armor. It's not a huge improvement, but it does stand up to just about all manner of small arms fire, Mordred advised. That is until a full thump was heard, and the gate was blown off of its hinges and sent skidding into the compound. Not really meant for explosives, though. Don't tempt fate, you guys. Her voice came back over the link, getting a deadpan from both of the other girls. Naruto was too preoccupied with his own bloody business to worry about the gate at the moment. As he expected, the mess hall was effectively a one-sided slaughter in his favor. He wanted to feel the same sense of success and joy he did from wiping out Grimm, but this didn't give him any emotion approaching that. Instead, he felt almost ashamed about how he had cut these men and women down with such ease as they screamed in terror. 
Uh, Naruto, we are going to need Bane on this gate. They have a couple of up-armored trucks with some boosted firepower that they are wanting to move up, Artoria advised. On my way, but wouldn't it be better to have Mordred blow them up with a couple of rockets? He asked as he strode out of the bloodied cafeteria. Well, I'd love to, but my hands are full. These two cages are welded shut. These friggin' sickos really intended for these poor kids to starve to death and rot in them. Mordred replied as Naruto caught sight of the girl digging through a couple of tool caches in what looked to be the compound's makeshift motor pool. All right then, how about an update on those kids, Urza? Naruto asked. We're in good shape here. They're hungry and a bit bruised up, but they will be fine. They have been hugging me and crying and cheering like mad since I showed up. Evidently, they know who the Knights of Beacons are, Urza replied. The muffled sound of several children all talking at once could be faintly heard over her radio. Well, at least these stupid-ass titles are good for something, Mordred commented as she stormed out of the motor pool with a small handheld torch in hand. The two in the cages are in a lot worse shape. Tough little ones, though. They are a bit beat up, but practically skin and bones. I thought they were just little kids, too. They are just so malnourished, but evidently they're both twelve, Mordred rambled a bit. The state of the children had shaken her a bit, and she was clearly stressed out. She had a pretty good grip still, though. Naruto turned his attention back to the gate where the vehicles Artoria had pointed out crept forward. A pop sounded, and the front truck's gunner dropped dead with one less head giving Naruto the window that he needed. The Beast of Beacon rushed forward while Bane transformed back into its bladed form and the ammunition retracted to the pack on Naruto's back. As he closed in, the front car slammed itself into reverse to try and escape only to slam into the front of the second. Trapped, the driver could only bring his arms up to shield himself uselessly as Naruto swung Bane back and brought down on the cab. The driver blinked in shock when he realized he was still alive. Bane was caught in the splintered and warped armor that had replaced the exterior of the vehicle. He took a ragged gasp in relief at the sight, only to widen his eyes in terror once again as Naruto ripped the blade free and shifted his grip to stab down directly through the mesh the driver had been seeing through as he drove. With a grunt of exertion from Naruto, the blade plunged through the weakened metal and through the driver himself. Naruto yanked his weapon free, just in time to roll off of the front of the vehicle as the second truck's gunner opened fire. The heavy weapon in the truck tore the top of the first vehicle to ribbons, but the gunner was too slow in following his target to stop Naruto from circling around the two vehicles. Suddenly closing the gap before the man could spin his weapon around, Naruto chucked his sword like a spear, not only impaling the man but hurling him off of the back of the vehicle. Naruto left his weapon for the time, being as he forced the fingers of his armor into the small gap that made the doorframe for the driver's side of the truck. His armor whined faintly as he used both his own enhanced strength and that of his armor to break the latch and force the door open, allowing him to reach in and grab the driver and pull him out of the truck. The man screamed shortly before Naruto broke his neck. He could feel the pop even through his armor and struggled to keep the thought of the act out of his mind as he retrieved Bane from the chest of his previous opponent. Not opponent, victim. Another pop from Artoria's rifle let him know the fight was not yet over, and he reset his mind on his objective. The remnants of the purebred were breaking and running at this point. They clearly realized that they couldn't win and hoped to escape. However, even in that, they had no chance. Naruto transitioned Bane back into its ranged form yet again while Artoria kept up her steady pace of picking off exposed and vulnerable targets. The end of the fight was as unfair as the start had been. A long burst of gunfire, and the last of the purebred fell dead, leaving only the objective of saving the children. Naruto was happy to take his attention away from the carnage he had wrought on their targets. Hopefully helping take care of the kids would keep his mind occupied until the army arrived and they could leave this place. Fortunately, the Valian soldiers sent to clean up the mess that Team Eminence had made of the purebred compound. Unfortunately, they were still too slow to stop Mordred from becoming especially attached to the two children who had attempted to escape the compound and been locked in the cages as a warning. The others had spent a couple of hours trying to explain why it was better that her new, unofficial adopted siblings be taken to a new home by the soldiers. They had actually lost the argument when Mordred fired back that nowhere they took Rennie and Nora would be acceptable or anywhere near as good as back home at the Ark Estate with her mother's and big sister. 
Artoria had agreed to that, plus she knew how much the mothers and their elder sister wanted more kids to baby back on the farms. What sold Urza was that both had their aura unlocked and would do better being raised by a family familiar with the needs of a budding pair of hunters. For Naruto, it had been the thought of them being separated into different homes. The sight of Lyran, as the boy very clearly preferred being called by a bit Nora, holding the smaller and more friendly Nora close to him like he was trying to shield her from the world nailed the coffin shut for Naruto as he agreed they should go to the arcs. The plan was easy enough to come up with. Artoria and Mordred would get a hold of their sister, Bargast, so that she could meet them in Vale. The Ark family had some aircraft of their own. Nothing truly fancy, but they were one of the wealthiest families in Vale's territory after all. Naruto and Urza, on the other hand, had the unenviable objective of trying to run interference with Ashbin and Glinda. So while the twins rode back with the army and set things up for Ran and Nora, Naruto and Urza made their way back to the Munchak. They told the pilot the other half of their team would be heading back with the troops and piled into the aircraft for the ride home. It was a quiet ride. Despite being in their armor still, the two held each other close and silently struggled with the looming thoughts of what they had done. Urza was less bothered. Her only kills had been the sentries she had eliminated and one guard inside the children's barracks. She didn't really know how to comfort her shared boyfriend, though. He had clammed up about the ordeal entirely, but she had come to know him well enough to know he was feeling like a monster. Any words she could have used to try and reassure him felt hollow to her, so she settled with holding tightly to him and removing their helmets. She planned to use his scroll to contact Crow about what had happened. She was thinking about calling her mother as well, though she wasn't sure what to expect from the woman as far as support was concerned. Either way, at least they had one another and would soon have the rest of their team as well. She also planned to reapply for some actual time off for the team. They needed it now even more than they did before visiting the Ark family. When the Munchak set back down at Beacon's airfield, both Naruto and Urza felt a mix of emotions at seeing Glinda waiting for them. The woman had a worried look that morphed into abject terror when she didn't see half of Team Inime disembark from the Munchak. Whoa, whoa, relax, they're fine. Just, um, wanted to be extra sure with the kids being safe, is all. Naruto said, trying to calm his mentor down. What? She asked in mild shock. Um, they want to make sure the children got settled all right, Urza said. Glinda stared at them for a minute before a thin blonde eyebrow arched upward. She didn't say anything, simply giving them a clearly disbelieving look. Both knew that she saw through them too easily, so they had to accept they would be explaining everything to her later. As if to literally save them by the bell, Glinda's scroll went off and she stepped away from them to answer it. She spoke in hushed tones before shooting a glance back toward Naruto and Urza. She quickly ended the call before sighing and readjusting her attire. Both Naruto and Urza cringed slightly at that. It was a tell that the entire team had noticed. At the moment, Glinda was rather frustrated. That probably meant there was something bad about to happen. It would seem the three of us are to be summoned to Ashbin's office. Come with me. Glinda said stiffly before leading the way toward Ashbin's tower. The walk there was quiet beyond a few students murmuring and pointing. The two knights cringed slightly as they glanced at the blood on their armor. Urza had some, enough to easily notice on her bright silver armor, while Naruto was nearly painted in the red fluid. Despite his red and black apparel hiding much of it, the slick substance was still very clear to those who watched them closely, which was most of Beacon unfortunately. I wish we had time for you two to get cleaned up, but the headmaster sounded rather agitated over the scroll. I think it's best if we get this handled as quickly as possible so his anger doesn't build, Glinda said. Naruto and Urza shared a look at that. They couldn't even picture Ashbin being angry with them. They were about to see it firsthand, though. As the elevator doors outside of Ashbin's office slid open, the three occupants frowned at the sight before them. The typically calm and collected headmaster stood before his desk clearly waiting for them to arrive. Come in and close the door behind you if you would, he said simply with a clipped tone as he turned and made his way around his desk to his chair once again. The deputy headmistress ushered the two students forward before she closed the door behind herself and took a place standing behind Ashbin and to his left. Naruto and Urza remained before him, standing in the center of the room as if they were on trial. I see your teammates are not present with you, 
He began with a raised brow, clearly not asking a question but making a statement about something that was not what he had wanted to happen. Yes, they went with the soldiers to make sure the children were taken care of, Urza defended. Ah, well, more specifically two of the children, correct? He asked, getting a blink of confusion from the other three in the room as he continued on. They contacted Miss Bargast Ark to come and retrieve two of the children you all rescued, am I correct? Glinda realized in that instant that Ashbin had bugged the communications of the team. He was spying on his own students. Naruto and Urza hadn't quite narrowed it down to that, instead thinking he had some informant from the soldiers he had sent for the children. She, I commend your compassion, especially in the face of such a mission as what I sent you on. Your actions were not cleared by myself or Professor Goodwitch. I now have to explain to my contacts in Atlas why it is you will not be able to attend this week's tests as I had planned. Ironwood was especially displeased to hear of your tardiness. Ashpin spoke quietly but sharply, looking more displeased than either Naruto or Urza had ever seen. The pair were a bit confused as their own team mentor looked especially pleased at the moment. Almost like the two professors were set in contrast to one another. We're, um, sorry, headmaster, Urza tried. Ashpin adjusted his glasses but otherwise said nothing in regards to Urza's half-hearted apology. As you will not be able to attend the plan test, I have another mission that perhaps would be better suited for you too. A guard detail. The Junior Mistral and Veil Fighters tournaments are both set to begin this weekend. You too will attend the tournament in Mistral and provide security. Your other half will do the same for Vale. Go and clean up. You still have classes to attend, Ashpin said as he clearly dismissed the pair. They had the decency to flee from the room, shortly followed by Glinda, who was still in the process of making calls and plans for how to properly shield her team. Ashpin simply frowned from his place at his desk. His frown deepened as a quiet alarm went off on the screen beside him and displayed the word, Incoming Call from General Ironwood. The man on the other end would make it clear that Ashpin was not upholding his side of their bargain as he had promised. It was bound to be annoying. It was strange being on Ashpin's bad side. He usually seemed impossible to agitate, but clearly, the man was unhappy with them. After all, he knew how much they had slowly come to dislike being around the public with their growing fame. It was only worsened by their newest mission, which was being proclaimed as a daring rescue of imprisoned children from a terrorist group. The headmaster's punishments were unnecessarily creative and easy for him to pull off. He knew that making them act as additional security for such an event as the junior tournaments would be the equivalent of throwing them to the wolves. No doubt they would be swamped by adoring fans. If that was all they were, it would be fine. Somehow things had taken a bit of a dark turn in their fan base, though. The going rate for an autograph from Naruto was insane at the moment, and for Urza, it was even worse. Especially with how many creeps wanted a chance to try and cop a feel while snapping a picture. They couldn't even harm anyone who tried to pull that off, just hospitalize them. Ashbin had made things even worse by spreading the word that they would be there, and that Naruto had recently started dating his teammates. They weren't exactly sure why he made sure to know about their relationship status, or why he was so intent on making every aspect of their lives public knowledge, but it was beginning to wear on the team, especially on Naruto and Urza, who took nearly two hours to get to their hotel room from the airport when it was normally a 20-minute walk. They were both exhausted by the time they got into their room, a cramped little single bedroom rather than a suite that they knew Beacon could afford, probably another little addition to their punishment. It didn't have much of an effect, though. They had gotten used to sleeping in the dirt. Besides, they would be curling up together on that bed to sleep for the rest of the day after the trip from Beacon. Naruto tested out the springiness of the bed and frowned a bit when it barely had any give. It's going to be like sleeping on the ground again. We've had worse. Remember that mission to the northern border of Vale? Nothing but mud and so cold. Urza commented as she set their clothes into their proper places. Yeah, well, it did give us an excuse to share body heat. Naruto chuckled getting her to smile over at him. That part wasn't bad, she admitted before turning back to the task at hand, while thinking back to the closeness they had all experienced on that mission. If it hadn't been so cold, she would have tried something. Then again, despite what she knew she would have to face on this mission, perhaps this week would be the perfect time to actually take her relationship with her boyfriend to the next level. 
Her grin turned a bit sultry and devious at the ideas of how to angle their time into that course of action. Maybe direct would be the best path, or she could do that thing that she and Artoria had talked about. Just come out of the shower dressed in nothing but a towel and slip into his arms. Then, oh dear, she would just have to. Urza, are you alright there? Naruto asked as he noticed his girlfriend standing frozen with a glazed look in her eyes. Oh, I'm great. Just great. Actually, I am going to get a quick shower, she said as she stepped into the bathroom. Naruto shrugged before blinking. Did she take any clothes into the bathroom with her? He shrugged again. If she needed him to pass her clothes, he would. Plus it might give him a chance to put the moves on her. Just imagining the slip that would push the door open a bit too much and he would be such a gentleman as he made an effort not to ogle her assets. Then he would suggest that it's only fair if she sees him naked as well. He shook his head with a grin at the stupid idea in an attempt to go further with her than they had in the past. His train of thought was interrupted by a heavy banging on the door that caused him to sigh. No doubt that it would be some fan that had tracked them to the room. They'd probably be trying to get revealing pictures of them again or something. As he stepped up to the door and opened it just enough for him to stick his head through, though, he didn't expect a very large man to shove it open wide enough to get half of his body into the room. Naruto was not necessarily an aggressive person, even when dealing with the paparazzi assholes that he and his team had begun to collect as a following. This was going too far, though, and Naruto felt his body instinctively push into a combative mode as the man tried to force his way into the room. Without thinking, Naruto slammed the door back against the man trying to come in. It shocked him when the door bounced back by a clear use of aura, one that came almost instinctively to the man, meaning he was either a huntsman or had been trained extensively in the use of his aura. Why the hell are you in this room? The man demanded from the teenager in front of him in a deep baritone. I'm pretty sure that's my line. Naruto snarled as he yanked the door out of the way and grabbed the man by the lapels of his suit and made to bounce his head off of the wall. Naruto had been right about the training as the man twisted around and tried to reverse the maneuver on Naruto. The Knight of Beacon was too well-trained and experienced to allow such a thing, though, and quickly went from grappling with the big man to landing a series of rapid and brutal blows across his face and chest that drove him back. With a hop, Naruto snapped a roundhouse kick square to the man's stomach and sent him back into the hallway and into the opposite wall. Dad. A young girl cried out as the man slumped down on the floor with a look of surprise at what had just happened. The girl, and who Naruto could only assume was her mother, rushed to the man's side while the man stared up at Naruto for a moment until his eyes focused on something beyond him, causing Naruto to turn. Urza stood with a shocked look on her face, wrapped in only a towel. She grimaced at the sight of the people in the hallway before sending Naruto a small look of confusion over what exactly had just happened. Dad? Urza murmured, causing Naruto to blink before turning back to face the man as he slowly stood back up. Dad? Naruto repeated her words briefly as his mind rebooted for a moment. Urza, why are you undressed? The man, who evidently was her father, demanded. Urza paled for a second until Naruto, saw a familiar look appear in her eyes. He instinctively took a step out into the hallway, clearly out of Urza's way, as she began to advance and thump her own shocked father in the chest with an index finger. After all this time, that's all you have to say to me? Nothing but, why are you undressed? What is it to you, huh? Urza began to rant, all the while jabbing a finger into her father's chest painfully enough that he began bringing up his aura to shield it from her tirade. Naruto awkwardly glanced around as Urza quickly worked herself up into a fury pointed at her father. A few other people staying on the floor were beginning to come out of their rooms to watch the commotion, and Naruto could easily pick out the pair of photographers snapping shots of the situation near the elevator door. Great, Glinda is going to be really pleased with all of this. Naruto quietly mourned their future selves, as Glinda was very particular about the image they presented to the public. Mm, excuse me. The young voice beside him returned his attention to the girl who was clearly Urza's sister, and the woman beside her who was clearly her mother. Oh, uh, hi. Naruto awkwardly greeted while forcing a grin onto his face. Hello there. My name's Piranikos. You're on my sister's team from Beacon, right? 
You're the beast of Beacon, Pira said with a bright, innocent smile on her face. Yeah, that's me. Just call me Naruto, though, Naruto replied, trying to be polite. Nice to meet you. You kind of already met my dad, Laiko, and this is my mom, Thetis, Pira introduced her parents. It's a pleasure, really. I just wish Laiko hadn't tried to barge in on you like that. He's been all worked up to lecture Urza since he found out about her being in one of those frontier relationships. He doesn't exactly approve, Thetis said as she glanced back at her husband. The man seemed to hear her as he turned the tables and began ranting at Urza, only for Urza to brush past him, snatch Naruto's hand, and drag him into the room with her once more. Mom, Pira, I'll see you both down at the hotel cafe in an hour if you want to talk, Urza said as she stormed into the room. It was nice meeting you, Pira said to Naruto as Urza slammed and locked the door, ending the interaction. Pira slammed the bathroom door behind her as well, and in the quiet that followed, Naruto heard the shower kick on. He blew out a sigh and shook his head before moving over to where his things were and organizing them for his stay here. And I thought things were going to start out so well this week. I should have known better, he grumbled as he set to work. Urza, before we head down, Shouldn't we talk? You've never been so pissed before. At least I've never seen you so pissed before, Naruto said as Urza quickly dressed beside him. Had they not been dealing with things now, he would have loved to try something. She hadn't cared about changing in front of him at all, though, so he knew she was still boiling with anger at the moment. The redhead bit her lip for a moment as she looked over at her partner and boyfriend. She very nearly clammed up entirely as she did so. However, the look he was giving her melted away any hesitation she had, and she felt herself flop onto the bed beside him with a groan. I don't know how to deal with them. My dad pushed me around and even just aside for so long that it all sort of came back to me at once. He hasn't even checked in with me except when we first became kind of famous here in Mistral, around the time of the Heldrake mission. Before that, he hadn't even seen me for a few months prior to when I left for Beacon, she admitted. That's been years. What about your mom and sister? He asked, hoping for a better situation than with her father. The guy seemed like he was used to being able to just push his way into whatever he wanted. The fact that he was surprised Naruto was willing and able to lay him out supported that theory too. My mom tries, she just makes excuses for my dad. So I sort of cut her out of my life too. As for Pira, I haven't been fair to her. I know that, but how the hell do I make up for just separating myself from her? I haven't even spoken to her in years, and all because I was jealous that she got all of dad's and most of mom's attention. Urza shook her head, close to tears now. Not for the failing relationship with her parents, though that did upset her greatly. It was because she was certain she had ruined any possible relationship with her baby sister over childish reasons. His girlfriend's words struck a nerve with Naruto. Recent conversations with Crow pushed their way to the forefront of his mind for a split second before he pushed them out of his head once more. Pira had a similar issue with her little sister that he did with Yang and Ruby, but at least she had spoken to Pira through her mother while at Beacon. Naruto had never contacted his sisters at all. He knew all too well the weight that stopped Urza right now. Shame. It gnawed at both of their hearts and hurt so terribly, but still there was nothing they could accomplish in fixing it here in this room. Who knew, perhaps helping Urza to reconnect with at least her mother and sister would allow him the strength to reach out to Yang and Ruby too. You want to be closer to her? Naruto asked suddenly after both had laid in the quiet for a bit with their hands intertwined. Just thinking about the situation. Yes, but the closer I am to her, the closer I am to him. My dad might not have considered me as valuable as Pira when she discovered her semblance, but now that I am the damn angel of Beacon, he wants to just come in and run my life for me again. I forgot how bad he was until the first thing he does when we see each other for the first time in years is try to force his way into my hotel room, try to fight my boyfriend, and then try to yell at me for wearing a towel when getting out of the shower. Urza huffed. She also refrained from thinking about the fact that she most definitely planned on many things that Lyko Nikos would not approve of her doing outside of marriage especially with her boyfriend who was an open polygamist. Naruto was silent for a bit as a bitter truth sank into his head. Something he thought that Urza was likely overlooking. Something he had overlooked with his own situation until now. Urza, you've told me a bit in the past how brutal your dad could be in training you, 
and pushing you to the limits with your semblance. How really bad it could get, Naruto slowly said with a soft voice. Yeah? She slowly replied, turning her head to look at him in the eyes, trying to discern where he was going with that, but already feeling a pit form in her stomach, one that turned her shame at practically abandoning Pira to more of a sense of immense regret. Do you think he has changed at all? Naruto asked. Urza frowned more deeply at his words. She knew the answer before he had even asked. Judging by what had happened in the hallway earlier, her father hadn't changed a bit. No, that was wrong. He had changed. He seemed even worse than she remembered. Once more, Naruto kicked himself for never checking on Yang and Ruby, leaving it to Crow instead. Both Naruto and Urza could leave such responsibilities on the adults that should be taking care of their younger sisters, but it was difficult not to feel some responsibility toward them. Especially in Naruto's case, after all, he was the one responsible for Yang and Ruby when their mother had died. Why did he think leaving it to Crow had been in any way a reasonable idea? He and Pira both could argue being kids themselves impaired their judgment, but such arguments didn't really work all that well against your own mind. With his girlfriend not answering his previous question, but Naruto having figured out the response himself based on her expression, he decided they needed to make their choice. Urza, this is up to you now. Are we going down there to meet them, or are we keeping our distance? Naruto asked her. She bit her lip in thought as her eyes slid closed to block out other inputs and focus everything she had toward what should have been an easy decision if not for the baggage that hung from the situation. Urza Nikos was no coward though. While she preferred showing that bravery against grim or terrorists or something, she knew that sometimes the thing she feared, her enemy, was herself or rather her emotions. We're going down there, she said resolutely as she stood to her feet and quickly smoothed out her clothing. Naruto smiled softly at her as she did. You got it, Captain. With that, the pair wasted no time in making their way down. The hotel was pretty crowded. But by now Naruto could see that his and Urza's images from the debacle in the hallway were already on display on a few of the televisions running in the lobby and cafe areas of the hotel. The fact Glinda hadn't called them yet made Naruto a bit nervous. But maybe the news just hadn't spread too far yet. The camera doesn't do you justice. Naruto teased lightly to try and ease Urza's tension at meeting up with her family again. She blushed quite a bit at the fact that she was clad in an incredibly revealing towel on the national news. Somehow, the fact that she was here in Mistral for the tournament, even just as security was big enough news to be mentioned, the fact that she was caught in the hall fighting her apparent family with nothing but a towel on while her publicly recognized boyfriend manhandled her father was something that made headlines. Great, she murmured with a dead voice. Hey, no worries, I kind of think it's funny you are teasing the country with a hint at a sight none of them will ever get. Only me, Naruto said with a smirk getting her to chuckle a bit at his words. A little bit of her tension drained away at his joking. The two young hunters noticed Pira and Thetis both sitting alone at a table in the back corner of the cafe. Both had been turning their heads back and forth between the various entrances until they spotted Naruto and Urza. Pira excitedly waved at them while Thetis held up a hand for them to easily pick them out, as if the bright red hair of both of them didn't stand out clearly. They both seem really happy to see you, Urza. Naruto quietly told her, but still grabbed a hold of her hand as she seemed to wilt at the sudden reality that she was about to see her family again. Right. They're happy to see me, she mumbled. Slowly, they made their way over to the pair of redheads and Naruto, for the first time. Got a chance to see just how physically similar all three were. It was almost like looking at the same person at different stages in their life. Urza, sit beside me. Pira said as she hopped up to pull the chair closest to herself out for her elder sister. Naruto nudged Urza when she hesitated, but thankfully Pira didn't notice. The older girl took the offered seat while Naruto sat beside Thetis and gave a reassuring smile to his girlfriend. All the while, her mother watched the interaction between the two with obvious interest. She didn't say anything against it, but her expression was unreadable for him. Where is dad? Urza asked. He had some paperwork to fill out so that Pira could enter the juniors tournament, Thetis answered. I'm going to fight in the official tournament for the first time. A year younger than everyone else, Pira said while glancing toward Urza shyly. Clearly she was trying to sound humble, but wanted to impress her sister. 
Urza blinked before giving a more natural smile than the tight one she had sat down with. Naruto began to smile more as well as he saw her slowly begin to relax and even enjoy the company of her little sister and mother. I can't wait to watch it. I'm helping with security this year so I hopefully won't miss a second of it, Urza said with her beautiful smile in place. Pira brightened up considerably, her shy nature beginning to fade as she beamed up at the older redhead. That is until she shot a glance over toward Naruto. She smiled, but it lessened quite a bit. Are you going to be doing security for the tournament too? She asked. Yep, Naruto replied easily. He chuckled as Pira nodded her head before turning her attention back to her sister. It was a bit awkward at first, but steadily, with the absence of Lykonikos to ruin it, the conversation kicked off. Thetis was an extremely kind woman as far as Naruto could tell, and it seemed like the absence of Urza from her life had been breaking her heart. She never said so openly, but he could tell how much she longed to be around her daughter again just by noticing the similarities to his own thoughts toward the girls. The amount that this situation was forcing him to think about his family was more than a little concerning. Especially as he saw Pira completely ignore anything regarding the fact that Urza had essentially moved away to avoid her in particular. The girl just wanted to get to know her sister better. It was moving, really. The way Urza melted under the adoration of her baby sister wasn't something he thought he would ever see. That wasn't to say that Pira didn't have plenty of questions for him. Most were basic things, or occasionally a question that was meant to get more information about her sister through him. He didn't mind answering. That is until she began asking him much more personal questions in such an innocent way he couldn't help but answer, even if he felt a bit vulnerable in doing so. At least he could tell that Pira was perhaps the most genuine and sweet person he'd ever met. She wasn't asking the questions to get at him, just to try and get to know her big sister's boyfriend. So he answered everything she asked to the best of his ability, even the ones he realized made things a bit awkward, like the questions about how he was dating all his teammates. The Nikos family wasn't from the wilds or the frontier, and so multiple partners like he had were incredibly rare and even considered taboo. He also awkwardly answered her questions about his family, getting Pira interested in meeting his younger sister at some point since they were both her age. Thankfully after that, Thetis took some pity on Naruto and bid them both farewell and led Pira away, back home. As they watched them leave, Naruto slid over a seat to be beside Urza and took her hand once again. She practically worships you, Naruto said, getting Urza to fight back tears. But why? I ignored her and avoided her. Why does she love me like that? She didn't seem to have any kind of resentment toward me at all, even though I used to. Urza trailed off as she realized she couldn't finish that sentence. It would kill her inside a bit to say such a thing out loud. Naruto just comforted her as best he could. Finally, he broke the comparisons between their situations. While Urza's father had created the problems within the Nikos family and they had been fueled by Thetis' docile nature, Urza had come to resent Pira because she had effectively replaced her. Now though, she didn't see the replacement that she had been avoiding for so long. All that there was, was her sweet little sister who adored her despite everything. Urza, don't dwell on your past. It will poison any relationship you might build with her. Unless you still? No, of course not. She interrupted him before he could continue. I just, it feels like I'm lying to her by just putting all that behind me. How is it a lie? You want to be around her now, and you want to be a part of her life. You love her, and that's why it kills you to have missed out on time with her. I think that the whole phrase, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, applies here. She wants to be around you, and you want the same. So just forget the past and be happy, Naruto said and slowly Urza's damp eyes dried as a determined look entered them. She squeezed his hand in appreciation of his words. Let's go back to the room. We don't have any tasks or meetings till the morning, and I could use a nap I think, Urza said, getting Naruto to nod. Really, she wanted to just curl up with him and relax. Her nerves were a bit frayed, and everything from shouting at her father, which was a first for her, to realizing how badly she wanted to be around Pira, she felt drained. That sounds pretty nice. Naruto agreed with the idea of a nap. A tiny voice in his head was upset that their apparent window to take that next step had closed, but he stamped it out ruthlessly. That could come any time. For now, 
some cuddling and perhaps kissing was the way to go. The next morning, Naruto and Urza had to sit through a mind-numbing briefing for the security operations of the event. Joining them were a handful of other hunters, mostly from Mistral for obvious reasons, as well as roughly three dozen other security officers. Some were off-duty police or, in some cases, retired military. Their numbers would be bolstered by on-duty police who would primarily focus on the exterior of the arena, while Naruto and Urza's group were the acting security for the building itself. The entire overly long meeting could have been summed up as de-escalate any fights between the audience and otherwise be easy to spot for the spectators. Nothing more than overzealous fans were really expected, but it was best to be on guard for the possibility of some sort of agitators making an appearance as well. At that point, they were to make sure everyone was safe and call the police in to handle it. Naruto had to wonder why Ashbin thought this might be a good punishment for them. Really, the only negative part had been the fans. That thought led him to realize they would be essentially in an arena full of thousands of people that worshipped the ground hunters walked on, and as two of the most famous hunters in active service right now, Naruto and Urza would be effectively walking into the lion's den. After the meeting, Glinda managed to get a hold of them on their scrolls. The lecture about proper decorum had been expected. The blushing and oddly interested way she spoke about their apparent exhibition fetish had been too much for Naruto, who had hung up on the woman. He knew he would suffer for that later, but honestly, from the way she had been acting, Naruto wasn't sure he would be opposed to her punishment for him. After that, the couple had most of the day to themselves as they were not expected at the arena until five in the evening. So they decided a nice brunch and a tour of Mistral was best. They had a pretty decent time as Urza showed her boyfriend around her home city with an innocent excitement they rarely got to enjoy. Of course, the occasional person recognized them despite their civilian attire, and a few pictures and greetings were required. Thankfully, the average fan wasn't as crazy as what they had gotten used to dealing with. Eventually, they made their way to the arena. The fans were already starting to show up, and the crowds were growing in size rapidly. Rather than immediately head to their places to stand watch near the arena floor, the pair headed for the competitors' boxes where Urza's family was gathered with Pira as she was getting ready to compete. The girl happily chirped a greeting to Urza and Naruto as they stepped into the room. Laiko seemed to be simply content with shooting a glare Naruto's way before briefly glancing at Urza. His expression was conflicted before it became blank and he turned his focus back onto Pira and pulled her focus back to getting ready for her upcoming fights. Naruto and Urza wished her luck and headed back up to their positions. They were both hoping for a bit more conversation, but Lyko seemed intent on interfering with anything he considered a distraction for Pira. Their place was thankfully out of reach of the majority of fans. Plenty took a quick picture of them, but the focus remained primarily on the arena floor. Naruto and Urza both breathed a sigh of relief at that as they had grown a distinct dislike of attention being showered on them. The first of the fighters was impressive for their age, but compared to what Naruto and Urza had expected from their own childhoods, it was a bit lacking. Thankfully, as the event progressed, the opponents involved seemed to grow greater and greater in skill. By the time Pira stepped onto the arena floor, the crowd had been stirred up by a series of four excellent fights between aspiring students at Sanctum Academy. They still were less impressive than Naruto personally had expected, but he realized that his training under Crow and interaction with prodigies like Urza, Artoria, and Mordred had skewed any sort of perception of fighters he had. Naruto and Urza cheered for Pira as she stepped into the ring. She appeared confident and ready to fight, though both of the more experienced warriors could see some hesitation not due to the fight, but due to all the attention turned her way. It seemed being the sister to the Angel of Beacon had already made her a crowd favorite. They hadn't even seen her fight before and already expected amazing things from her. No pressure at all. Opposite her was a larger girl, a couple of years older than Pira and armed with an oversized club-looking weapon that doubled as a cannon. As the older girl leveled the barrel of her weapon at Pira and the bell rang for the match to begin, things started off with a bang. Pira easily avoided the cannon's shot by catapulting herself over the attack. It was a bit of a gamble as she couldn't maneuver while in midair, but she had bet correctly that the large weapon took time to reload. Time Pira used to shift her weapon to its rifle form and open fire on her opponents as she closed the distance. 
Not only was the older girl's aura taking hits, but she also stumbled back at the hail of fire Pira sent her way. Enough that she was on the back foot when Pira reached her target. While shifting her rifle to its sword form, Pira slammed her shield into the other girl and sent her sprawling. Her aura flickered from the assault and fell into the yellow, never needing to fall lower as Pira tapped the tip of her sword against her opponent's nose. With little other choice, the older girl yielded to her, giving Pira the quickest victory in the tournament so far and without having her own aura used at all. It was silent as the audience stared at her in shock until first Urza, then Naruto began hollering their approval and cheering for her. The announcer joined in next, bellowing about the outstanding display of Pira Nikos and touting her as the most impressive contestant so far. Pira happily waved at Naruto and Urza before bolting back to her parents, waiting in the competitor boxes for her. She didn't quite know how to handle the attention of all the audience members as they began to roar and scream her name and cheer her on. Her next fight came soon after as the tournament bracket began to quickly shrink in size. Time and again, she bested her opponents until she found herself in the semifinals, having not lost a bit of her aura in any of her fights and simply waving to Naruto and Urza before silently returning to her locker room over and over. Pira had already won her place as the sweetheart of the audience. They adored her apparent cheerful and slightly shy attitude, while loving the fact that she seemed to be following in the footsteps of her older sister. As the festivities wound down for the night and the time was set for the semifinals the next day, Naruto and Urza again approached Pira to congratulate her. Urza froze for a split second as the younger redhead barreled into her with a hug. Once she got over her surprise, though, Urza eagerly returned it, fighting back the flood of emotions that such a simple gesture brought out in her. Naruto stood off to the side as he watched the two sisters and mother all talk animatedly. It brought a smile to his face to see Urza happily spending time with her family. Most of her family. Like Onikos approached Naruto and actually looked him over a bit, but it didn't bother Naruto. Laiko might have a reputation here in Mistral and might be considered a rough and tough bastard by the majority of people who interacted with him, but Naruto knew the man was past his prime and couldn't back up his talk anymore. At least not against Naruto. Branwen, I want you to end things with my daughter. That polygamy that you have somehow tricked her into is a shame to my family. You're a distraction she doesn't need as she is starting her career, the man stated bluntly. Naruto could appreciate that. He didn't want to sit and chat with the man either, but he also wasn't about to give in to his demands. He and Urza had a connection even stronger than that with Artoria and Mordred. He loved all of them. He was certain of it by now, but he especially cared for Urza. She wasn't just his girlfriend. She was his partner in pretty much everything. You don't beat around the bush. I won't either. No, Naruto said simply as his focus turned back to look at the girls chatting about some of the moves Pira had stored away for her upcoming fights. I wasn't asking, Lyko ground out. It's gotta kill you to control them their entire lives, and now have absolutely no control of Urza at all. Just makes you sick, huh? Don't worry. I'll take excellent care of your daughter for you, Naruto said as he let a smirk that he had picked up from his time with Crow slip onto his face. Lyko grew extremely cold as his face became devoid of any emotion. That set Naruto on edge slightly. He had picked up from his time, dealing with nomads alongside Crow that the ones that seemed to be emotionless when angry were the most dangerous to deal with. I will pay you a sizable amount to end your romantic interest in my daughter. Lyko muttered stoically. The girls couldn't hear what the two of them were talking about, but they had clearly noticed that neither was getting along, as Naruto's grin had become especially toothy and less happy, more manic. Lyko remained emotionless as he stared at the boy in front of him. Urza slowly stood to her feet, ready to intervene. She had never seen the expression Naruto currently wore on his face. He looked ready to snap and beat her father down at any moment, and as much as she didn't get along with the man. A lifetime raised by him had made sure she loved him in a twisted fashion and wanted the best for him as well. You can't buy her from me. I don't own her. And even if I did have the ability to sell her like that, I wouldn't. She's worth more to me than anyone could offer, Naruto hissed out, still too quiet for Urza or the others to hear. I'm not offering to buy my daughter from you, you little creep. I am offering you money to publicly end this little farce of a relationship you have the media eating up, Lyko growled back softly. 
Pretty sure I already told you no, you old bastard. Get those big ass ears checked, Naruto said before turning to send a much more relaxed smile toward Urza. She remained concerned but returned a weak smile and rejoined her mother and sister in their conversation. You have no idea what, Lyko began, only to stop as Naruto pushed off of the wall and leaned into the older man's personal space. No, you have no idea what you're dealing with. Keep pushing it. See how that ends for you. I will warn you though. You think you can get whatever it is you want by throwing your weight around and making threats. That works here in the cities. There's a million assholes just like you. Where I was raised, though, you don't get crap till you're the only one to take it. That's why I'm going to take your daughter and walk out this door and up to my hotel room with one bed. And I'm going to be in there for hours on end with her while you get to imagine all the things she and I do together. Naruto all but whispered to the man. You, Lyko began, his voice beginning to raise. You want to try some crap with me? Tell you what, the night after the finals I'll be here in the arena with Urza. You come too, and it can be settled there, Naruto said as he walked over and took Urza's hand. Hey, let's go get some rest. Pira needs to do the same, right? Gotta knock him all dead tomorrow again, right? Naruto asked as he sent a wink toward Pira, who smiled brightly up at the blonde. You're right. I do feel pretty tired, Mom, Pira said as she turned her attention to Thetis while Naruto whispered into Urza's ear, causing her to flush slightly. Lyko looked ready to blow a gasket, but he simply stood there as Naruto and Urza bid their goodbyes to Thetis and Pira. That had Naruto smirking his way all the way out of the door. By the time they had reached the hotel room, though, Naruto had psyched himself out of going forward with trying to take the step with Urza. It felt entirely wrong and petty to do it simply because he knew it would infuriate her father. Sadly, had he known that Urza was just waiting for him to proceed and initiate something, she would have happily reciprocated. She was still waiting for him to make an attempt when they curled up into bed and slowly drifted off for the night. That left both a bit frustrated and disappointed. Though Naruto did take consolation in the fact that Lyko had no way of knowing what they had done once the door to their room had closed and sometimes the act of not knowing was more torturous than the act itself. The next morning, they repeated much of what they had done the day before. They went to see more sites, including the training gym that Urza had frequented with her father until he had a private training center constructed. Now he kept it mainly for Pira's use and rented it out to other wealthy families for exorbitant amounts. The exclusivity and old fame of Lyko and the Nikos family did all the advertising for him. They noticed the people were a bit better at keeping respectful distances in that area. Fewer tourists, more locals, though plenty still took a quick picture when they recognized Urza. They also began chattering with abashed looks as they looked at the two young adults. It didn't take a genius to figure out that Urza's old neighbors were scandalized both by her current relationship and the images of her standing in a crowded hallway in nothing but a towel. The pair decided it was for the best to head back to the arena sooner than they normally would before the stage whispered insults and rumors put a damper on their mood. They managed to catch Urza's family before they headed into the competitor boxes. So once again, Urza began talking with her mother and sister animatedly, while Naruto and Lyko both more or less stayed out of the way. The blonde couldn't help but smirk a bit as the man glared at him with rage burning in his eyes. Oh, the thoughts that must have been going through his head. Eventually, the group separated, and Naruto and Urza once more found themselves waiting for the matches to start, as a few people snapped some pictures of them or waved hello in excitement. They played their parts well and waved back, being the friendly and perfect examples of huntsmen that Ashbin and Glinda desired them to be seen as. Pira was the first to fight today. Just like the first day, though, she showed no hesitation or weakness as she started the fight with an intensity none of her competitors could match. Her opponent was a boy nearly old enough to graduate into the senior academies that Naruto and Urza currently went to. Even still, he couldn't land a hit as she danced around him and put her shield to use. Soon enough, the fight was over as she shattered his aura and knocked him unconscious. The crowd went wild, none more so than Naruto and Urza though who were close enough to the ring that Pira could hear their words over the others. Like the day before, she shot them a broad smile and boisterous wave before racing back to her competitor box. Most of the fights at this stage were impressive, 
Naruto and Urza both picked out various things they considered best from among the competitors. Of course, whenever Pira was in the ring, their focus was honed on how well she was doing. No one could touch her. Any that came close still missed somehow, though both Urza and Naruto had a good idea how. Pira had begun to use her semblance in perhaps the most subtle way either had seen before. She just offset her enemy's weapons enough to set herself up for perfect attacks that she made look easy. Her semblance is powerful, but to be able to use it to that extent is insane, Naruto muttered to Urza. She trains incredibly hard. Harder than I did at that age, maybe, Urza whispered back. She'll go far, but Lyko has reached his peak at what he can teach her, I think. She needs another mentor, Naruto pointed out. Urza knew what he was trying to say, but both remained silent after that for a time. They continued to watch the next fight. Eventually, Urza leaned back in to whisper to Naruto. What did you say to my dad yesterday? He's been glaring at you even more than after you manhandled him at the hotel, Urza asked. Ah, uh, well, promise you won't be mad, Naruto awkwardly said, causing her to lift an eyebrow up. He had expected her to be angry at him for saying something like that to her dad, but instead, she cackled almost like a villainess from a children's cartoon at least until her face became very serious as she stared into his red eyes. You were just gonna leave it all to his imagination? She asked. Naruto swallowed thickly at that. Well, I didn't want to do something like that for petty reasons. But you did want to do something like that, she pressed on. With that, Naruto realized that Urza actually wanted to have sex with him as much as he wanted to with her. Tonight, when we get back to the hotel, he said simply, causing her to blush slightly and smile, both of them silently cheering finally in their heads. Down in the arena, the last match of the semi-finals ended. Pira's opponents for the finals the next day would be a girl that would be entering Haven Academy in six months. By all accounts, it was an unfair matchup. Still, neither Naruto nor Urza doubted Pira would pull out on top. They'd seen both finalists fight for the last two days, and they had full confidence in Pira. Like the day before, the two of them went down to the competitor boxes to greet Urza's family. She had a bit of fun in mind, though. She wrapped her arms tightly around Naruto's own and enveloped his limb within her very well-developed chest. She even leaned into him as they greeted the rest of the Nikos family. Lyko looked outraged but remained silent as he stormed out of the room. Thetis looked a bit scandalized but bit her tongue and instead happily greeted her daughter and once more joined in the excited interaction between Pira and Urza. Tonight Naruto joined in as well, though the conversation was shorter as Lyko returned and dragged Pira and Thetis off, while saying Pira needed her rest for the finalist fight the following day. Naruto wasn't complaining a bit as he and Urza made a beeline for their hotel room, ignoring the intrigued looks at the much closer body language the two had than before. Nothing like that could ever be missed by their fans after all. Urza clicked the lock on the door before slowly pivoting to stare at Naruto, who stood before her with a bit of excitement and lust burning in his eyes. Slowly, she stepped over to him and leaned up on her toes to kiss him. As she did so, Naruto wrapped his arms around her. Just as Naruto's fingers managed to get Urza's bra unfastened, only for them to both jolt in shock as Urza's scroll alarm began going off and pulled them out of the moment they were in. The red head glared at the device across the room on the television stand. She hopped out of bed and grabbed the scroll, only to notice it was a call coming from Mordred. Agitation slid into worry as she answered the call, and Mordred's face appeared on the screen. Urza, hey, I just saw that stuff about you in a towel in a hotel hallway. Did you and Naruto finally take the first step? I can't believe you get the first shot. Wait, why is your bra falling off? Oh my god, Artoria. They were about to do it, Mordred said in a flurry of words, only to take off across her own hotel room to try and share the call with her twin. The team leader of EMNA did the smart thing and hung up and even muted her scroll. No more interruptions. She spun on her heel and jumped into bed with her boyfriend, getting a laugh from him as she did. By the next morning, both of them needed to shower to purge their bodies of the sticky and sweaty feeling they had. Urza was glad she had been taking medication in preparation for finally sleeping with Naruto. Otherwise, she would be scrambling for a morning after solution. They had both decided not to have a repeat performance in the shower that morning. As they took their time to enjoy the morning, 
Not even the addition of photographers and interviewers bothering them at breakfast could ruin their morning. They both were simply too happy and blissful. Something both Thetis and Lyco took note of as they met one another again before the finals fight. Thetis seemed conflicted but happy as she saw how happy Urza was while Lyco literally snapped a clipboard he had in his hands in two. Naruto began really looking forward to the night he and Urza had planned for the man throughout their day together. Pira, of course, was oblivious to the situation. She simply thought that Urza and Naruto were so happy and relaxed because they should be as a couple and that they were excited for her fight, which they were indeed excited for. As they settled into their places for the final fight, Naruto and Urza were even more vocal than before in their support for Pira. Now that there were television crews for the finals fight as well as actual broadcasters for news programs, the atmosphere was even more excitable and chaotic. Plenty of reporters mentioned Naruto and Urza's presence as they hollered their support for Urza's sister. Pira was already national news as she had reached the finals in her first year without so much as a hit to her aura. The country was enamored with the angel's baby sister. Everyone, let's give a great big welcome to our two contestants. Our first fighter, returning champion Rosa Star. The announcer hollered over the sound system, sending ripples of cheers and applause through the crowds. Rosa is here for the last time, win or lose, but she is going to be trying for that record of first to win two championships in a row as her last act on the circuit. He continued before turning his attention to the much smaller figure on the opposite side of the arena. Now let's welcome our challenger. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Pira Nikos. The announcer continued, getting a huge amount of applause that caused the 13-year-old to blush slightly. Still, she looked the picture of confidence as she stepped onto the stage for her fight. Little Pira had already set records this year for being the first to ever make it this far without even having a solid blow land on her. The question is, can she keep it up and take the title of champion, the first to ever do so under the age of 15? He continued. With a ring of the bell, the two girls began circling one another, looking for a weakness to exploit and launch their attack. Rosa truly was good and wasn't about to underestimate Pira. She knew the little redhead had earned her place in the finals, and she had no intention of losing to her now. Pira acted first. Her rifle transformed and snapped off two shots of dust-charged ammunition. When they impacted the ground just in front of Rosa, they burst into a cloud of smoke, and Pira then launched her true attack. The crowd screamed and roared. Some booed as they couldn't see anything due to the smoke. But the occasional clash of metal and the rapid-fire pops of their weapons told everyone that the girls were fighting harshly. However, those that were paying attention would notice that Rosa's aura meter had taken a handful of hefty losses while Pira's had been untouched. Rosa seemed to realize that remaining in the smoke would lead to a very fast and humiliating loss, and so she launched herself in a backflip out of the smoke and toward the edge of the arena. Just as she landed, though, a spear shot out of the smoke and slammed into her gut, shattering her aura and causing her to stumble back. Just as she seemed to recover, Pira herself rushed toward her, shield held up, protecting herself until it slammed into Rosa and smashed her into the ground, just outside the edge of the ring. And it's over in a matter of moments. Pira is the newest and youngest champion of the Mistral Juniors tournament, the announcer declared sending the crowd into a frenzy as they heard that. They cheered and shouted for Pira. For the first time ever, a contestant has won this tournament without so much as a scratch on them. This girl is invincible, he declared, and the crowd cheered again and again. Even louder as Pira helped her opponent up in a show of good sportsmanship, the cameras followed after her as she ran off toward the stands and wrapped both Urza and Naruto into a big embrace still riding high off of her victory. It was shortly before Lyco dragged her off for the post-final interviews. It was time her fame made him rich in his mind. Lyco would market Pira on everything he could get his hands on. Naruto and Urza helped to clear out the arena for a couple of hours after everything. They wished they could spend more time with Pira, but a few hours later Thetis sent a message to Urza saying the girl had practically passed out after all the interviews. The fight hadn't taken as much out of her as the circus of people congratulating and talking with her. For tonight, they were fine with that. Especially since they could see Pira in the morning before they left for Vale. Right now, 
Their attention was focused on Lyco as he strolled into the arena clad in his old battle armor and armed with his old weapon from his time as a champion fighter. So, boy, I hope you brought some gear to fight. Otherwise, showing you what for just wouldn't feel as good, Lyco stated as he stabbed his long sword into the ground. Huh, why would I fight you? I already hooped you back at the hotel, remember? Or did I hit your head against that wall too hard? Naruto asked. Lyco's eyes narrowed into slits as his anger finally began to get the better of him. You cowardly bastard. You dragged me out here too. I didn't say you weren't gonna fight, but the thing is it wouldn't matter if I hooped your ass here or there. Or you beat me to a pulp or anything. See, the thing is Urza chose to be with me. Despite me being in a relationship with two other women. That's too much for you to handle. I get that. But the thing is it doesn't matter because I would still be with your daughter even if you want. You could put me in the hospital and we would still be breaking the bed just like in that hotel room. Naruto said as he stalled for Urza to retrieve her weapons. He had stalled all that he could though. Lyko let out a roar of fury and tore his blade back out of the arena floor to charge at Naruto. The team didn't even move a step back at the sudden attack. Instead, he simply smirked as Urza's weapons clashed with her father's, and she forced him back out into the center of the arena. Urza, what the hell are you doing? Did you not just hear how he spoke about dishonoring you? Lyko demanded. Naruto didn't say anything that I wouldn't. We did break the bed. It'll be fun when the headmaster gets that addition to the bill, Urza said with a forced chuckle. This isn't how I raised you. Lyko shouted. You're right. You raised me to be a perfect tool to make you money and fame. Then you threw me away to try and do the same to Pira. You are the only one that dishonored me. And you are doing the same to my sister and my mother. But I'm going to be staying in contact with them from now on. If they ever want the chance, I will be giving them all the opportunities that they need to leave you behind. Urza ranted as she pointed her blades at her father. Lyko shook his head in disgust. Are you done crying like a spoiled child? I gave you everything. Your status as the Angel of Beacon is because I trained you to be that. You have the gall to spit in my face like this. I hope your sister grows up to be more grateful. Urza didn't respond. She just launched her attack at her father and moved to take the advantage she created for herself by seizing the initiative in the fight. Lyko attempted to dodge out of the way, but the weapons had only been a ruse to give her an opportunity to close into him. She literally slapped his sword away and then slapped the chest piece of his armor before cartwheeling back with her blades, forming a sort of protective shield for her. Is that all? Lyko asked in genuine shock. No, don't you find it odd that I had the confidence to fight you in nothing but a blouse and skirt? That I didn't even bring my own armor? It's because I knew you would show up dressed in your gear. I know how skilled you actually are. You're a tournament champion, but you've never been in a real fight. And worst of all, you forgot what my semblance can do, Urza calmly explained as Lyko suddenly felt his sword pulled free of his grasp and joined with the circle of floating blades that Urza had hovering around her. Urza, he began only to yelp as he was lifted off of his feet and then slammed back down into the arena floor, causing his aura to drop nearly by half. She lifted him up again and shattered his aura before tossing him aside like he weighed nothing at all and turning away. She hesitated a moment as the badly bruised Lyko struggled to his feet. She contemplated saying something, but instead she just left, brushing past Naruto on her way out. The blonde Branwen stepped forward a bit so that he could better talk directly to the man who had upset his lover so badly. Don't contact her. If you want information about how she is doing, talk to your wife because only she and Pira will be able to speak with her. You're lucky I believe Urza can handle herself, because if I handled you for her, I would show you how pieces of crap like you were handled in the wilds, Naruto said before turning and leaving after Urza. Lyko rested for a time in the arena before slowly making his way home. He came home to an empty house and a note, simply telling him that Pira and Thetis were having dinner with Naruto and Urza because Pira had woken up again. They were also staying at the hotel to enjoy the jacuzzi and have breakfast together. The head of the Nikos family had to find his own dinner for the night something that he didn't usually have to do as he made sure Thetis knew what he expected of a housewife when they first married. He sat alone and ate a poorly made sandwich as his family spent their time with the boy that had stolen his daughter's heart. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, 
subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content. Click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.